John 10. We're continuing our study in the Gospel of John. We go book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and just study what God's Word teaches us. Um, and we look at these passages and just say, hey, what is God teaching us from this? And specifically, as we've been studying the Gospel of John, we've been looking at what is this section teaching us about Jesus? What does this show us about who Jesus is? And in light of that, how is he calling us to live? And so we've been in John for a while. Um, today we're closing out John 10. Next week is a very familiar passage, the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead, Some, um, a passage that fits into the season that we're in as we look forward to the resurrection of Jesus, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus here in a few weeks. And so this morning we're going to be in John chapter 10, going from verse 22 all the way to the end of the passage, John 10, 22 to the end of the passage. Now, as I begin, let me say this. One of the things I love, love about pastoring this church is that we are so diverse. Um, and I don't mean that just um, ethnically. Um, there, even in our the community that we're in, we come from all sorts of different religious backgrounds. We come from all sorts of denominational backgrounds. And so um, that is a lot of fun, but it's also a challenge because um, sometimes we will dive into passages that are a little harder for some of us to process because that's not how we grew up. And this is going to be one of those passages where um, I want to challenge you and encourage you, please don't judge the, t judge the sermon based on whether you like it or not. Don't judge it whether you agree with it or not. Don't judge it based on what you've been taught your whole life. But would you be like the Bereans and Acts and say, hey, what does scripture actually say? And would you examine it in light of scripture? Um, that this is a tricky topic because some of us grew up in churches that didn't believe in the person in the preservation of saints and the perseverance of the saints. And so so you might have grown up where you were taught, I was, um, I remember growing up where um, we had a pastor that was visiting us and me and my brother were in a fight and the pastor made a comment to us, hey, if you don't ask for forgiveness tonight and if Jesus comes back tonight, you're not making it to heaven. Our whole salvation was dependent on our work and it made me incredibly fearful of living my life. And so... Um, so we're going to look at a topic that um, is going to be challenging for some of you guys, but I want you to, again, evaluate it based on what does the scripture actually teach about this. Um, and then if you have questions, you are welcome to ask me, and we can walk through this and talk through this. Now, another thing I love about pastoring you guys, there's a lot I love about pastoring you guys, but um, another thing I love pastoring about you guys is our church is made up of all sorts of personalities, right? I mean, you guys are unique. Um, and God has created all sorts and all types of personalities here in our community. And part of my calling as your pastor is to help cultivate, help identify traits and gifts and um, what God is calling you to do as he's calling you to live out your life on mission for Jesus. And I'll find in the course of these years, in the course of knowing you guys, that some of you guys are leaders. Others of you guys don't want to lead you, but you are really good at, if you are told to do something, you will immediately do it. You're, some of you are intense. Others of you are absolutely calm. I mean, nothing rattles you. Some of you are analytical. You can, um, you, I say something and you're analyzing. You're, others of you are more intuitive. Some of you are literal, literal. I mean, it has to be exactly as it's said. Others of you are more pragmatic. Some of you are conceptual. Others are more practical. Some of you are introverts. Others of you are extroverts. But there's one thing that's true for every one of us in this room. No matter how you're wired, no matter how, um, how you process things, no matter what your style of leadership, no matter what your personality, no matter what you're like, we all need time alone. We all need time where we rest. Every one of us needs that time where we can rest. Every person has been create has to create space in our soul and find rest for our soul and our body. Some of us, well, not me, some of you guys gravi gravitated toward rest a lot more easier than some of us do. Others, but we all need it, right? Um, we all need that time where we rest. Now, there are many, many reasons why 
we need time alone. Many reasons why we need rest. It could be you're exhausted because you're running around after kids all day and they exhaust you, they wear you out. It could be that you're just annoyed and you need to give yourself a time out so you could rest. It could be because you've had some hard news or you've been going through some stuff and you just need time to get away and pray. It could be maybe because of embarrassment, because someone called you out on something and you didn't want them to call you out on that and you retire to your room or you retire to your um, place for a bit and rest. It could be guilt from sin. Maybe you're living in guilt because there's sin in your life and you can't seem to get over it and you just need to get alone with God and confess and repent. In our passage this morning, we're going to find Jesus who is no doubt exhausted. He's tired. He's worn out. At the end of chapter 10, we're going to see that he's going to make his way out into the wilderness um, to the place where he was baptized by John. Remember that he's been basically hanging around with 12 people for three years. Um, and listen, that, there's not a lot of relaxing around these 12 guys. This is not about, this, there wasn't a lot of space here. It was about these guys invading Jesus' space, right? And every time Jesus would get time alone, the crowds would follow him and they would take up his space as well. There was no space for Jesus. He was also faced with the constant badgering of the religious leaders, the perpetual unbelief of the crowds, the continual doubt of his own disciples. And on top of all of that, he stands virtually now in the shadows of the cross. The cross is just a few months in front of him. And he knows that in a few months, he's going to be completely abandoned. So here's the question I want us to think about in light of this this morning. Why does Jesus still hang out around the temple? Why does Jesus still rub shoulders with people that want nothing to do with him? Why doesn't he just pack up his bag and go to heaven? No one wanted to hear what he had to say anyway. By the end of the book, everyone is going to leave him, including his own disciples. And Jesus knew that was going to happen. Why didn't he just wash his hands of humanity and go on the offensive and leave and go to heaven? After all, he is the word who spoke the world into existence, and with a word he could do away with all of it. Martin Luther once said that, If I were God and the world has treated me as, if, as it treated him, I would kick the wretched thing to pieces. Aren't you glad Jesus doesn't? And on top of all of that, in our text this morning, the Jewish people and their leaders will ask Jesus to go away. If you look down at verse 24, it says they surrounded him like a pack of wolves. And in the original language, what, what basically what it's saying is, it basically says, how long will you put away our lives? The root word is away. Behind the language is not a question of the nature of Jesus, but an attitude of annoyance that he's still around. The idea is, why won't you just go away, Jesus? Why won't you just leave us alone? Why do you plague us? Why do you annoy us so much? We're bored with you already. Leave us alone. You gave us a free meal. You've done a few nice tricks. You've raised some people. You've done some miracles here. But now you're tiring us. You're wearing us out. Why don't you go pick up a kite and fly it somewhere? Take a hike. Get lost, Jesus. That's the language there. But why does Jesus keep coming back? Why is Jesus constantly coming back into the lion's den? Why is he here at the temple again, just steps away from where they tried to stone him in John chapter 9? Why is he still pleading and talking with people who have stones in their hands ready to kill him? Does he have some sort of complex that he's an aesthetic who loves getting hurt? Did he get a kick out of being threatened? And the answer is found in this discussion that we're going to dive into this morning in our text we'll find in this debate that Jesus has with the Jewish leaders that Jesus is hanging around with these people because he is a compassionate, faithful, and patient God. And he's absolutely relentless in his pursuit of his people. Let's look at how Jesus deals with these religious leaders. And we'll see that far from running away from people, that Jesus stands his ground and he pleads with them for one last time. Would you believe me? Would you follow me. And we're going to see three things here. Number one, we're going to discover that Jesus is compassionate. Jesus is compassionate. Verse 22. At the time of the dedication, at the time the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem, it was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So here we find Jesus again in the temple, the place where they tried to kill him. 
He's under shelter at Solomon's portico, no doubt, because maybe it was raining. Maybe it was just a bad day. It was winter, which means in that area of the world, it was raining heavy. Jesus tells us that it takes, John tells us it takes place during the Feast of Dedication, which what we call Hanukkah. It takes place around our Christmas time. And it was a fairly recent festival for the Jewish people. It, happened, it began um, just probably about 200 years earlier in the intertestamental period. What had happened was there was a Syrian king who came to conquer Israel after defeating Egypt. He came to Jerusalem to enforce Greek culture and language. He killed about a third of the people in Jerusalem. He outlawed the Hebrew scriptures. He outlawed circumcision. He crucified moms who had circumcised their babies, and he hung their babies around the moms' necks. And then he turned the temple into a brothel, and he offered a pig as a sacrifice to their god Jupiter on the altar of the temple of the living God. He was a bad dude. I mean, he was a bad guy. And there's a man by the name of Judas Maccabeus who gathered a militia of sorts, and he led a revolt and succeeded in defeating the Syrian king. And Maccabeus rededicated the temple and when he did, he called for an annual festival to commemorate that victory, to be reminded that God would deliver them. And that festival was called Hanukkah. And during Jesus' time, about 200 years later, they would celebrate Hanukkah for eight days, and they would light a candle called a menorah and blow one candle out each day. It was the last great deliverance of the Jews, which gave them hope that God would again deliver them, especially now because they were under the oppression of the Roman government. And on this day of celebration, Jesus enters. He stands before them for one last time, offering them a chance of deliverance and hope. And this festival is important, this conversation is important, because this is the last debate and the last conversation that Jesus will have with the Jewish leaders. At the end of this chapter, he will leave the city, and when he returns in John 12, he will be with his disciples, teaching them before he is betrayed, arrested, and crucified. Notice the irony in the text. They want Jesus to go away, but he's come to rescue them. They're celebrating the hope of future deliverance when right before them stands their deliverer. They try to kill the deliverer whom they have been celebrating to one day deliver them. And just like Jesus said in John 9, they're blind, even though they're religious up to their eyeballs. They want political freedom, moral approval, the proverbial plague and ribbon for the most being the most outstanding human beings, They're the law-abiding citizens, the good old boys. They're blind even though they see, and as they celebrate and hope for deliverance while the deliverer is standing right before their face. Can I ask you this morning, could it be that he, you're here this morning celebrating and singing about Jesus being your deliverer and you have the proverbial stones in your hand ready to strike him? Could it be that you, while you give lip service to God, don't really see a need for Jesus as your deliverer because you're good with your old-time religion? You do all the stuff that you need to do. You're leaning on your reputation. You're leaning on your religious rituals. Be careful that you don't read this text and assume that these Jewish people with these stones in their hands are the people, or those people, when they very well could be you and I this morning. Look at verse 24. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered him, I told you, and you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. Jesus says that the nature of his works would tell them that he, why he hasn't left them. The work should tell them that he's come to rescue them, that he's a Christ. The proof is in the pudding, Jesus says. If you're looking to hire a photographer for a wedding, what's the first thing you ask for? You ask for the portfolio, right? You ask for, hey, give me some evidence that you're actually good. And when you get their portfolio, if there is a thump in every picture, you're probably not going to hire them. If they cut off people's heads in every picture, you're probably not going with that person. And so Jesus says, look at my portfolio. Look at all the things I've done so far. They should tell you who I am. 
What did Jesus' work and miracles tell us about him? They didn't just say that he is God, because if he wanted to have a wow factor, he could have done much more spectacular stuff. He could have done outwardly miracles, like fly around the Sea of Galilee, and everyone would have said, wow, look at this, right? The miracles show something about Jesus' mission. You see, his miracles were restorative in nature. They tell us that Jesus was on a mission to restore humanity from fallen humanity back to himself. And thus, they showed us his mercy, his love, his compassion for those who are broken, those whom the effects of the fall of Adam had hit the hardest. Just, just think, just here in the book of John, the miracles that we've seen, the official son that was healed, the man at the pool, who at Bethesda, the man that was born blind, they tell us that Jesus is not just a God, but they tell us what kind of God he is, that he is loving, that he is merciful, that he is compassionate, that he is here on a rescue mission. Notice what the prophet Isaiah says that the Messiah would do. And Jesus quotes it himself in Luke 4. He says, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and placed, and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And all the eyes in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Why hasn't Jesus left them? Because he's compassionate. He's on a mission to restore lost humanity to himself. He has come for the broken, the blind, the rejected, the sinful. He knows the nature of man. He knows that we are all lost sheep without a shepherd, running amok, falling into pits, being attacked by prey. He knows that none of us want anything to do with him. A little religion, great, we'll do that. But wanting Jesus? No. We don't want that. These guys surrounding Jesus right now are blind to their need just like some of us are. And yet, despite their hardness of heart, despite their mockery, despite their ridicule, despite their threats, despite their unbelief, Jesus stays with them. He heals them. He restores them back to sanity. He feeds them. He welcomes them. He stays beside them. All of his works have been displayed, this amazing compassion, even though they didn't give it back to him. Even as Jesus looked at these religious leaders even after he condemned them. Notice what he says in Matthew 23. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I would have gathered your children together as, hen, as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. When he looks at Jerusalem, he doesn't turn away because of their rejection and the hardness of heart. He goes toward them. Back in the Old Testament, there's a story of a man named Jonah, and God looks at a city called Nineveh, and when he looks at Nineveh, Nineveh is a cold, hard city, and God doesn't turn away from Nineveh. He sends this man by the name of Jonah who doesn't share the heart of Jesus. In Jonah 4, it says, When God sent Jonah, it displeased him exceedingly. He was angry. And he prayed to the Lord, and he said, Oh, Lord, this, is this not what I said when I was at in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. And God still has compassion on Jonah. He grows a plant for shade, and he sends a caterpillar to eat it, and then Jonah gets mad. Verse 10 of Jonah 4, the Lord said, You pity a plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? Should I not pity them? Jonah runs away from the city in bitterness. Jesus runs toward the city in boldness when the Bible says he set his face toward Jerusalem. 
Jonah looked at the city and got mad because of the sins of the people in the city. Jesus looks at the city and sees their sin and he mourns and he weeps over it. Jonah sits under a tree and cringes at the repentance of a city calling for justice, calling for God to strike them down. Jesus hangs on a tree and cries out for mercy and grace and for God to forgive them. Jonah completes the mission, but he does it reluctantly. Jesus completes the mission, but he does it for the joy that's set before him. Jonah about died on a mission that he hated. Jesus was murdered on a mission that he loved. You see, the reason Jesus hasn't left you, the reason Jesus hasn't left me, isn't because you're a good guy or a good gal. It isn't because you're friendly or amicable. It isn't because you're a religious person or a good church person, church attending person. It is solely because he is inherently compassionate and loving. His love for you has nothing to do with you and your performance or your lack thereof. It is what we call unconditional love. I said it to you last week. God doesn't love you because Jesus died for you. Jesus died for you because God loves you. He loves you. You know the verse John three sixteen for God so loved the world that he gave his son, his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But why didn't these guys see this about Jesus? Couldn't they see his graciousness, his merciful nature in the works that Jesus was doing? Why didn't they believe that he was the Messiah, the Son of God? Verse twenty six you don't believe because you're not part of my flock. Do you say, do you saying you're blind? You can't believe. This is what we call total depravity or total inability of man to come to God on his own. My friends, don't picture humanity as a field of sheep with some of us running toward Jesus, the good shepherd. You need to see that none of us was running to Jesus. We were all running away from him. We were running as hard as we can and falling off of cliffs and into pits and thickets and tumbling down into dark valleys as ready prey for our enemy. Isaiah 53, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. All of us. We have turned everyone to our own way. Listen, if you're here this morning and you know and you love and you follow Jesus, you need to know up front that the reason you believe and see Jesus for who he really is is not because you were smarter or harder or more moral, but because of a sovereign grace and the compassion of God in your life. It is a work of God that brought you to repentance. Every person in this world, including you and including I, we were running from the shepherd. He came and he found us and he went ultimate fighter on us and he brought us back into the flock of God. Every person in this world is or was a lost sheep and Jesus in his grace reaches out and snatches us back. Lost sheep don't come home on their own. Jesus is compassionate. If you're a follower of Jesus here this morning, you're a follower of Jesus because he's a compassionate God. Number two, Jesus is faithful. Jesus is faithful. Verse 28, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hands. I and the Father are one. So Jesus picks up on the analogy that he was using in our text last week, the sheep, the shepherd metaphor. He's talking about the sheep that he rescues, the ones that he's gone ultimate fighter on, who are still nipping at his ears and scratching to return back to their own lostness. He tells these guys, listen, I'm faithful, and I'm going to keep my own. No one will be able to scare him off. No one is going to be able to pry open his hand, which is full of sheep, even though they're kicking and biting and resisting. No one's going to take them away. Here we find another great doctrine of grace, the preservation of saints. It's not perseverance, because If it was perseverance, you would actually be doing some work. It is preservation because Jesus keeps those who are his. Jesus keeps those who are his. It is within his power to keep, and it is within his power to let go. But notice he doesn't let go because he is absolutely faithful. He says he gives them eternal life. 
If it was able to be lost, if we could lose it, it wouldn't be called eternal life. It would be called temporal life or possible life. And then he says they will never perish. Not potentially not perish. They will never perish. Or we'll see how they do, and maybe if they do well, they won't perish. It doesn't say that. He says they will never perish. And notice in our text there's two hands involved. The son's hand is involved. The father's hand is involved. Why is the father's hand involved? I think it's to illustrate absolute security here. I've told you before, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, one God, three persons. God is in communion and fellowship and relationship with himself. He doesn't need anyone, doesn't need anything else to be satisfied and complete. The old church fathers pictured the three persons of the Trinity holding hands, as it were, and they were dancing together in perfect love, joy, and connection. And where do we come in in this relationship? When you come to Jesus in faith, And when you come to Jesus in repentance, and when you're restored back into relationship with the Trinity, you are restored back into that relationship. You were, as it were, you were let into that dance. You don't become God, but God holds you. It's like the Father is holding one hand, and the Son is holding the other hand, and you're just dancing around, and they got their grips on you. And Jesus is almost like, hey, just in case someone was able to get you out of my hand, The Father's got the other hand. There's no way one of us is going to lose you. Here's the point. No one is going to be able to pry you out of the hands of the Father, and no one is going to be able to pry you out of the hands of the Son, not even yourself. It's not that you are holding on to Jesus. Jesus is holding on to you. Some of you need to hear that this morning because you're living in guilt and wondering, am I holding on to Jesus? Listen. You're here this morning because Jesus is holding on to you. And he's not letting go. To think that you can lose your salvation is to be on par with a megalomaniac. You say, how is that? You think you have more power than you can get yourself out of the hands of God? You don't have the power to pry yourself out of the hands of the Trinity. The only way that someone could lose their salvation is if Jesus would let you go. And listen, he says he will never cast you out. John 6, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. I'll never cast out. On top of that, God doesn't treat you based on your efforts or lack thereof, but but on the record of Jesus. And listen, his record is perfect. The record of Jesus is absolutely perfect. To believe you can lose your salvation is to believe that you did something to gain it in the first place. And listen, if you believe that, that is a false gospel. My friends, if you believe that you did something to gain your salvation, then you don't get the gospel at all, and you're lost. All of salvation must be a sovereign grace, because if it's not, you can't have any assurance, because you're doing the holding on to. But some of you say, but someone else could grab us out of Jesus' hands. Really? Who? Satan? Can he take us out? Notice these words from Revelation. I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now that salvation and power and kingdom of our God and authority of his Christ has come for the accuser of our brother Satan has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God and they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb can Satan conquer us? no he's defeated but wait a minute won't preaching these doctrines cause us cause people to live like they don't care about Jesus live like hell? I don't think so. Listen, if this truly sinks into your heart, I think it will motivate you to greater living for Jesus, to greater heights of obedience. When you realize that despite your sin, despite your flaw, despite your mess-ups, that God in his grace loved you and forgave you and drew you to yourself, I don't know about you, but it makes me want to pursue Jesus even more. It makes me want to love and obey Jesus even more. It motivates me to greater obedience. Listen, I only have so much energy to burn. 
if I'm using my energy to try to secure my salvation, then I have no time to love, I have no time to worship, I have no time to serve, I have no time to reach out to other people. But when I'm not burning energy to secure my salvation, but rather resting in the promises of Scripture, I can give every ounce of energy that I have to love, to worship, to serve Him. Grace motivates obedience. Grace motivates us to obey. Look at these words from Titus for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passion, to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age. What motivates us? Grace. What motivates us this morning to worship? Grace. You're not, if you're here, we're worshiping and saying, hey, God, I'm here so that I can get to heaven. You don't have the gospel. You don't got it. If you're here saying, God, you rescued me, chief of sinners. I'm here because you have redeemed me. And in worship, I come. You get it? You understand that this is grace. You see, this is why Jesus talks about grace so much in Scripture. This is why he talks about the Father's love for the Son and the Son's love for the Father. Like on every page in the Gospel of John. When you get to John 17, that's all you're going to be hearing about, how much the Father loves the Son and how much the Son loves the Father. Why does he do that? It's all for our security. It's all for our motivation. It's all for our assurance. The more we see the love the Father has for the Son and the love that the Son has for the Father, the more secure we will feel because we're wrapped up in it. We're in it. We're in between hands. The Father's hand is underneath. The Son's hand is on top. And our hand's in between. And He's not letting us go. You can say, how does the Father's love bring security to... Father's love for the Son bring us security? Think about it from a parental level. Think about what it's like, right? Um, Yesterday morning, my youngest son walked into our room and I was lying next to my wife and he did everything possible to separate us, to jump in the middle, to get us to separate where he could jump in the middle and I wasn't letting him get in. There was no way, right? My wife just got back from Dubai. I'm lying next to her and he's like, he's trying and he's trying and the more he tried, the more he was having fun. The more he knew how much I loved my wife, the more assured and confident he was. When you have a good marriage and you're loving your wife well, your children notice that, right? And they have an assurance. My family's good. They're there. When you see the father loves the son and the son loves the father and somehow you're caught in the middle of that, man, that should give you boldness. That should give you courage. That should give you joy. That should give you worship because you know there's nothing that can take you away from him. What can separate us from the love of God? What? Is there anything? God's love for God shows us that he is not letting us go. He would have to un-God himself to do so. And that's not happening because if he did that, then the whole universe would unravel. And listen, that should motivate us to live for him, not run away from him. You say, well, what about those who seem to be like Christians and then they're here for a while and then they just walk away and they run away. What about them? John addresses this in his letter in 1 John. He says, they went out from among us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out and it became plain they were, they were not of us. What's he saying? There's some people that look like they're with us. The time, trials, tribulations, will show who's really of the flock and who's not. There are people in church today, and maybe you're here today who claim to be Christians, but your heart really isn't Jesus's. Remember Jesus in John 2 didn't believe their belief. These people came and believed him. Jesus like, I don't believe your belief. I don't believe you. They, they might not be falling off a cliff or falling into a pit, they might, but they're caught in thickets of religion and morality. They're seeking to avoid Jesus as Savior with their good works and all their righteous deeds. They're exposed to the good news of Jesus as Savior, but they reject it over and over, and this is a dangerous place to be. It's like they're around the gospel so much, they've almost become fascinated um, by it. A vaccination immunizes by giving a 
very mild case of the disease, right? A person who has been exposed to the gospel can get just enough of it to immunize them from the real thing. The longer they continue to resist, whether graciously or violently, the more they become immune to it. Their spiritual system becomes more and more unresponsive and insensitive to the gospel. Listen, folks, the gospel isn't something to play around with, and Jesus isn't someone to admire or contemplate or ponder on. He is someone that you and I need to respond to. If you're not having responded to Jesus, can I invite you to respond to him? So Jesus will not go away because he's a compassionate. Because he's compassionate, Jesus will not go away because he's faithful. Number three, Jesus will not go away because he's patient. He's patient. Let's go back to our text, John 10. Jesus, the Jewish people get upset with Jesus again. They try to stone him again. It seems like they always have stones ready when they're around Jesus. And he stands his ground again, and he passionately points them back to Scripture. He's about to, he's about to be stoned, and he does a Bible study with them. That's Jesus, right? In verse 34, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are God's? If he called them gods to whom the word of God come and scripture cannot came and cannot be broken, do you say of whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? Jesus basically says that his claims about being God are not far-fetched. God has even called men gods at times in the Old Testament. Psalm 82 is an example. The argument is from the lesser to the greater. How much more? The judges... Scripture says we're godlike because they had been consecrated for a special task and exercised authority and power. They are godlike in doing justice and bringing redemption and rescuing people out of slavery. Jesus says that he has been sent in the exact same way. If the word gods could be used of mere men because of their function, then how much more should it be used of Jesus? Jesus be called God in the full sense because he has received a unique commission, a unique power. You want to talk about patience? How about this? It's like Jesus has all these weapons pulled out against him. And instead of running or defending himself, he opens up scripture. Talk about patience. This is how patient Jesus is. Every page of John has Jesus as patient. It shows us that God can sustain great injuries to his name and his glory without immediately having to avenge himself. God has chosen to write a drama where he tolerates evil for a time and waits until later to judge fully. But his patience is not so that he can create a more interesting story. Rather, God is patient with humanity because of the cross. The cross allows God's justice to keep his sword down for a time. So he's, here's Jesus, ready to be stoned, and he doesn't run. He stays. If this is me, I would have long left this conversation a long, long time ago, right? And yet Jesus continues to plead with them to come to him. Listen, you may want him to leave you alone, but because he loves you, he won't. Because he cares about you, he won't. He will continue to knock. He will continue to prod. He will continue to send messengers until your very last breath. And after that last breath and your rejection of him, then the sword of Jesus will come out. His patience with you is for a time. And if you're here this morning, it's because Jesus is patient with you. If you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, you could have been anywhere else this morning. It is the faithfulness, the compassion, and the patience of Jesus that drew you out of bed. Maybe it was a friend inviting you. Maybe for some reason or another you woke up this morning and said, I need to go to church. It wasn't you. It is because Jesus will not give up on you. Jesus is pursuing you. He cares for you. He loves you. Verse 37, if I'm not doing the works of my Father, then don't believe me. But if I am doing them, even though you don't believe me, believe the works, 
that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Jesus again says, just look at my works. Look at what I do. Look at what I've done. Start there and work your way to figuring out who I am. The only conclusion can be that I am God. A demonic man would not cast out Satan for that wouldn't be helping the cause. That would have been shooting himself in the foot. A megalomaniac would not be helping the poor and helpless and spending all of his time with them, or rather be at palaces and on campaign trails. A lunatic would not have said the things that Jesus has said. He said things that left people speechless. No one has yet discovered words that Jesus should have said or done things that Jesus should have done. A fraud would have been uncovered by people who hung out with him 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for three years on a camping trip. The only conclusion of Jesus' continued presence and grace with these guys is, is, he that, is that he is the patient God of the universe. Listen, if you're not a follower of Jesus, this is where you need to start. Is there any sin in Jesus? Is there anything about his life that denies his claims? If he is not God, then who is he? Why won't he leave you alone? Why did Jesus draw you here this morning? Why has he continued to hunt you down and virtually breathe down your neck? You know what I'm talking about. Why does he keep coming after you and not just walk away from you? Why? Because he is patient with you. It is his patience that keeps you from being consumed now. It is his patience that beckons you and woos you to himself. It is not indifference, it is love. Second Peter 3, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some of you count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any would perish, but that all would reach repentance. Romans 2 says it this way, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient that God is with you? Does that mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended so that you would turn from your sin? Listen, Jesus is compassionate. Jesus is faithful. Jesus is patient with you. Why? Because he's God. Exodus 34. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the God, a merciful, the God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. How can he be so compassionate? How can he be so faithful? How can he be so patient with me? Doesn't he know me all the way to my bottom? Why doesn't he just walk away from me? Verse 39 of John 10. Again, they sought to arrest him but he escaped from their hands. He went away across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. And many came to him, and they said John did no sign, but that everything that John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. See, God can be patient with you and with me and not consume us because of Jesus' obedience unto death. Jesus was relentless. He drank the cup of wrath so that there is not a cup, there is not a drop left for you and I to drink. The Jewish leaders asked Jesus to go away in this passage, and he did so by going to Jordan, but Jesus would come back again, and they would tell him to go away again. John 19, they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify. My friends, here, here's the gospel. Here is how compassionate, faithful, and patient Jesus is. John 1 tells us that Jesus came to his own, and his own received him not. And then he walked around the earth healing and feeding and loving people, and they tried to kill him, but he escaped. 
Then he'd come back again, and they ask him to leave, and he crosses the Jordan. And then he comes back again to Jerusalem, and he weeps over this city, and then he, they arrest him, and they tell him to go away again. But this time, they crucify him, and they throw him into a grave. But this is the good news that Jesus didn't quit. He doesn't give up. He comes back again. This time, he comes back from the dead. Jesus is relentless in his pursuit of us. Jesus is relentless in his pursuit of us, and he is running out after you and I this morning. Praise be to God. You say, well, why did Jesus have to go away to the grave? He went to the grave because it was the only way that you wouldn't have to go away forever in hell. Either Jesus goes away for you, or you go away forever. We all yelled, crucify him, away with him. And he went willingly to the cross Willingly, in order that the Father would be magnified, that worshipers may be brought in by overwhelmed by His grace, so that He might show compassion towards you, be faithful to you, and be patient with you. Listen, those hands that hold you, they're wounded hands. Those hands that hold you are nail-pierced hands. Nail-pierced hands that will be forever visible for you and I to see. And they're powerful hands <coughs> Excuse me, that will never let us go. I don't know where you are this morning, but I'm sure some of you mourn your own failures in life. You see the relentless compassion, faithfulness, and patience of Jesus towards you who never quits, and yet you quit on him all the time. But listen, failure is never the final grace of God. Failure is never final with the grace of God. I quoted a very long quote last week by a man by the name of Thomas Kramer, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about his story this morning as we close. Thomas Kramer was a pastor during the English Reformation in the 16th century. He endured in following Jesus during the reigns of King Henry VIII, King Edward VI, and laid the foundation of what is called the prayer book, which is still be being used by the Anglican Church today. But toward the end of his life, he lived under the reign of Queen Mary, who later became known as Bloody Mary, because she killed Protestants. Eight pastors had died for their faith in Jesus before Thomas Kramer's very eyes, and he was about to be the next. From the moment that Mary came to become Queen of England, Kramer was marked for dis destruction. He was the one that was on top of her list. So she finally had him arrested and examined and gave him an opportunity to relent, to recant of the gospel publicly, to deny Jesus. Others had gone before him, they stood their ground firmly and died. He also stood his ground and defended the gospel admirably. And like the others, he was pronounced guilty of heresy, condemned and sentenced to be burned alive at the stake. What was he guilty of? Believing that salvation comes by faith alone in Jesus, apart from anything you and I can do. But then something startling happened days before he was supposed to die. A few days before he was supposed to be burned, he decided to sign a recantation for his belief in the gospel. He couldn't bear the thought of dying at the stake. The community of believers were discouraged. Bloody Mary rejoiced. But as fits her cruelty, she told him that he would be burned anyway. And yet by the grace of God, as he was led to be burned, Kramer repented of his fall and resolved to die in the faith of the gospel and cling to Jesus. J.C. Ryle, in his book, says it this way, with a light heart and clear conscience, he cheerfully allowed himself to be hurried to the stake amidst the frenzied outcries of his disappointed enemies. Boldly, undauntedly, he stood up at the stake while the flames crawled around him steadily, holding out his right hand in the fire, saying, with reference to having signed a recantation, this unworthy right hand, and steadily holding up his other hands toward heaven. Of all the martyrs, strangely to, strange to say, none at the last moment showed more physical courage 
than Kramer did. Nothing in short, on all of his life, became him, became him so well as a manner of him leaving it. Greatly he had sinned, greatly he had repented. Like Peter he fell, but like Peter he rose again. Listen, this morning you may have greatly sinned. You may have greatly failed, but Jesus is relentlessly compassionate. Jesus is absolutely faithful, and Jesus is patient with you.